At Stantec, we're improving health worldwide through the power of design, and sustainability is a core value of our approach. When it comes to decarbonization, now is a time to be focused and bold. With that, I'm pleased to introduce today's keynote speaker, Dr. Penny Bellum. Dr. Bellum is the chair of the Board of Vancouver Coastal Health. She is a clinical professor of medicine at the University of British Columbia and a fellow of the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. She has had a 35-year career as a health leader and academic clinician in British Columbia. Dr. Bellum served as BC's Deputy Minister of Health from 2001 to 2006, took a brief pause, and then served as the City Manager for the City of Vancouver from 2008 to 2015. Dr. Bellum has extensive board experience in the public sector, nonprofit, and private sector boards, and has received significant public recognition for her work in medicine and public service, including a number of significant awards, the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal for Public Service, the 2012 Wallace Wilson Award for Leadership, the Marion Powell Award from Women's College Hospital for Leadership in Women's Health, and the Kennel Award from the Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Canada. Dr. Pellum, Bellum, apologies, advises governments across Canada on health policy, health systems, and health human resources. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Bellum. Thanks very much, Paulina, and um, thanks to you, Ian, uh, and your organization for the privilege of coming and speaking today. Um, just listening to your comments, first of all, I really appreciate the land acknowledgement. And, you know, I think beyond acknowledging our Indigenous peoples in this country, we could learn a lot from them around sustainability, looking after the land. Um, we have a province, we have 203 First Nations communities in our province. And I've traveled all over the province and, you know, the ones particularly in the rural and remote areas where they continue their, their you know, early ways of living. Um, it's quite shocking when, when you hear how we as settlers have changed their world um, from a sustainability perspective and a respect for the land, for nature, uh, for all the things that we value. So um, really want to appreciate it, that it's really, they, they can teach us lots and they, they have a way of looking at the world, at, at health, at our, our at nature that uh, we could really learn from. You know, my perspective in this is I'm not an expert in the, in the technical aspects of decarbonization and greening healthcare, but my experience comes from really trying to figure out how we are going to move this agenda, particularly in the public sector, but not, not exclusively there. So it, it is just to Ian's point, it's leadership that it's leadership and the engagement of all of our, our teams, our, our staff and our community, our families, like the more we can lead and talk about how important this is, um, the faster we're going to start to make a difference. And I'm, I'm going to come back to, you know, we, who work in the public sector, and those of you in the private sector who work with public sector organizations, we can't expect government to do it all. It's very clear from COP this year, last year, I had the privilege of being at COP in 2013 in Warsaw. That was the first time local government had been invited to actually attend, um, being the level of government that has to deal with the crisis of the impact of climate change. Um, and had never been part of that conversation. Um, this is our summer in BC. I, I spoke to some of you in 2021, where we had had a summer characterized by the heat dome and forest fires, um, and then floods, all in the middle of COVID. We had massive floods in the Fraser Valley, which, as you know, is the most populated part of, uh, of British Columbia. But this summer was truly frightening. And I, I can tell you that, um, for me, Personally, it was the first time I ever really felt true climate anxiety. And we see that in our kids, in our university students, and in many people. And I think the forest fires that, you know, up in the top quarter of uh, this top left-hand corner is the British Columbia app, the fire service app, where you can go on every day 
and see what's going on in terms of fires. And, and this one just shows the hot spots from red to orange to yellow to green. But when you actually saw the individual fires on that app throughout the last six months, it was just full of little red dots of different sizes. It was our whole province was on fire. And on the bottom left, you can see one of the more isolated. We have, you know, a lot of areas in British Columbia where no one is around. And that fire on the left was one of the ones that burned, is still burning, um, and just put in a massive amount of smoke. But the one on the right is Kelowna. And some of you probably have visited there. That's looking across the lake uh, to West Bank and Kelowna. And you can see the, the housing, you know, on the lake and, and up the hill. And, you know, as you know, we lost hundreds of houses in that fire, and it was absolutely terrifying. And the fire jumped the lake, which I don't think any of us thought would be possible. So the issues are very real. Um, we're also having water issues in British Columbia, and, and this has two concerns for us. First of all, access to safe drinking water is a fundamental foundational public health measure on the, on the, the um, Sunshine Coast, which is you know up the coast from Vancouver, Seashelt, Gibson's, all of you remember that TV, uh, that TV show, The Beachcombers, that was filmed in Gibson's Seashelt, and then you take the ferry up to Powell River, and then we go up Vancouver Coastal up as far as Bella Bella and Bella Coola, way, way up the coast. But we are we're losing water. It's drought that we've had now for a number of years, and this is the Lake Lake uh, Chapman up near Seashelt, and they were basically restricting significantly restricting water this year. And we, we were the recipients of evacuated patients from Yellowknife from the fire they had, um, acute care patients. That's the first time we've ever received acute care evacuations. We've, we've had experience over the last five years with patients from long-term care being evacuated from the interior, but this is the first time we ever had to uh, receive people who were evacuated from acute care. A couple died on the plane down. These are very, very devastating things that are actually going on today. And, you know, unfortunately, this is what it's taking, I think, to galvanize our public, if not our governments, that we really have to take this seriously and take action. So the, the, uh, the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, there's one every year, and this is the one that came out this year. And I think, you know, the, the mantra is time is, has kind of run out and, and time for devastating consequences is, is running out quickly. And I took their little table around the impacts of climate change, um, which if you have a look at it, you can see that some are very, very well evidenced and some a little bit less so. But at the end of the day, when I map just British Columbia and the things that we have been impacted by, I put a little star under each of those ones in this. And you can see actually, to my surprise, we're feeling the impacts of climate change pretty much across the board in the areas where the science has shown that it actually makes a difference. We're, we saw this year um, pretty intense changes from drought um, with our crop production in the Fraser Valley and other parts of the province up in the Peace. Um, physical water availability, fisheries yields, if you talk to our Indigenous peoples and people in the fishing industry and uh, the DFO, we, we know that salmon runs are, have been significantly distorted. We know that tuna, orca runs up and down the coast of Western Canada and the United States are, are very different than they've been. There's, there's massive changes to the fisheries. Um, you know, mental health disorders, I, I think some of you I talked to last night talked about the smoke that you experienced, you know, for the first time really in Ontario that was coming from Quebec, from the forest fires in Quebec. And for those of you who visited Kelowna in the last few summers, you know that actually summer in Kelowna is starting to look pretty much full time like the apocalypse. And it's a it's a terrible, terrible feeling when you're you're just living day to day in that smog um, that hurts your throat and your chest. And it's a very oppressive feeling and it leads to lots of mental health issues. Um, people are being displaced, and we saw that in the interior. We, we had thousands of people displaced from their homes on evacuation orders. On and on it goes. So this is very real. And, you know, healthcare makes its contribution, as you know. Um, and it, it isn't just through facilities. In fact, the 4% of global carbon that we emit, um, or CO2, really relates to our supply chains, to, to our energy use, 
and and also to um, bio waste, right? Uh, and and the, the waste that we send to our landfills or to incinerators. So, you know, it's really incumbent upon us across the board in our healthcare uh, sector to actually address all these different areas because some of them are very, very significant. And, you know, while we figure out to Ian's point, you know, how are we gonna make our facilities more efficient? There's a lot of things we can do on our supply chain and our bio waste. And we need to think about that. And, and you know, one of the things that I wanna urge all of you, because you're all in pretty much the facilities business. And, you know, the more you talk to sort of across your organizations to colleagues who are clinicians, colleagues who are responsible for sort of corporate services like waste and, um, other things besides facilities, um, there's a lot of work we can do. And the more we integrate that thinking across the organization, my experience in the city of Vancouver and in Vancouver Coastal is that it actually moves it faster. And you engage all of your staff because all of these, you know, portfolios drive down to thousands of members of our healthcare staff. And if they're not engaged and understanding why this is important and the connection of what they do whether it's in supply chain or what they use in the operating room or, you know, the heating and, and the basic foundational activities of facility is not so much in their, in their purview, but waste and, you know, how they, they do or don't recycle, what we're eating, where it comes from, um, the, the different parts of supply chain and different parts of our hospital, all these can start to be relevant to them and they can see how they can make a contribution. So I think you know that the climate footprint of healthcare is very significant. It's you know nearly five percent of global emissions. And if you think about you know just our sector, I think you know that's that's quite remarkable and something that we we have to really focus on. And you know it is the emissions that are the largest. But as you can see, energy sources that we purchase, um, whether we're producing it or we're purchasing it, um, and then healthcare supply is a very, very significant issue that we just really haven't had enough attention on. And in Canada, you know, in most provinces, we, we have central procurement of many hospital supplies, pharmaceuticals, um, you know, other supplies that are used on, on our wards, in our operating rooms. And, you know, the other supplies that actually support, you know, big kind of residential organizations. And um, I, I think that we have major leverage because we buy in bulk often at the provincial level. And so it's, it's not like you're dealing with hundreds of different organizations all making a one decision. You, we can actually influence those things um, up, the, up the chain and, and, and they will be a major point of leverage for us. So, you know, as Ian mentioned, and I think as you heard last year at this time, you know, connecting the dots for people, not, not just what they see on TV and experience day to day, but also in actual health issues connecting the dots between climate change and, and how that's impacting our health. And then the whole issue of, you know, our obligation as a health sector to be climate resilient. So when there's a response, it's very much like local government. When there's a flood, they have to respond and figure out how they're gonna protect their public. It's actually not the national governments or even the provincial governments to a certain extent that are on the ground. It's actually local government that carries that responsibility. And so we have to be and the health sector is a big part of that because when people get into difficulty or they can't get to the hospital or they can't get their medications or they can't get dialyzed, as we found out the hard way with the flooding in the Fraser Valley and, and with the forest fires that were blocking major roads um, into you know, more isolated communities in a very mountainous province, we have to think about what are we gonna do about that and how are we gonna protect them? So we have multiple responsibilities for response for emitting and, you know, and, and for protecting our public over the long term with some of these chronic illnesses that you see on this slide. We're, we're fortunate in British Columbia, we actually have legislation um, that actually starts to start to drive the public sector to pay attention to this and make it not just a policy, which policy was brought in under Premier Campbell. Now we actually have legislation that actually creates some accountability for us. And you know, one of the things about legislation as I learned um, as a deputy is you can legislate, 
But unless you have really hard consequences, um, you know, it doesn't always have the impact that you hope it will. It creates, you know, a, a, a very clear rationale for why you need to move, but without some of the, you know, tougher uh, accountabilities, then it, it doesn't have the same impact. So I would say our Climate Change Accountability Act is mostly about being accountable and reporting and working toward goals. Um, because as the public sector, the government tends not to find the public sector because they're finding themselves. Um, but it's a real step forward to acknowledge, you know, at the most powerful level the government has, which is legislation, that this is really important. And, and then we have mandate letters that come through, which I think is happening in Ontario, but to every of the five geographic health authorities in British Columbia, which encompass the whole province. And, you know, the public is divided up into... You know, they're all allocated to, depending on where they live, to one or another of the regional authorities. And really, the power of that is, for example, Bruce, um, Vancouver Coastal, we have one and a three, 1.3 million people who live in our geographic health authority, and we're responsible for them, from the cradle to the grave, for their protection against all risks. And so that that's an accountability. It's a bit different from a hospital where you're responsible for the people that end up in your facility. But here we're responsible for everyone, whether they need our healthcare services at this point in time or not. And what it does is it, it creates, uh, you know, in some ways a much higher obligation of concern for the broad public. And that, that, that goes for all of the five regional authorities in our province. So what it does is it allows us to engage in this conversation with our public. And we have a mandate letter that comes from the Minister of Health that's signed off by the Premier, and it lays out you know, all the different areas that, that the government wants us to work on, what, what they we're supposed to deliver, targets, and we report on that on an annual basis. So it's a really great tool. And, you know, as, as a leader and a member of a senior team, it can be quite irritating to be told what to do and all these targets you have to meet. But, but actually to drive a focus and priorities, it actually is really, really useful and helps to, you know, orient our thinking to, you know, achieving these goals. So in our mandate letter is a very clear um, direction around the legislation and around the targets that we have to meet and the reporting that we have to do around our emissions in the healthcare industry and our, our resilience and response capability for dealing with the impacts of climate change. So, you know, whether your mandate comes from a minister's letter or from your board, from the ministry as a hospital, um, or a health authority, you know, you need to leverage that. Having a mandate, it's sort of like the old days when, you know, you didn't really want to go to the rock concert. And so you used to say, well, my mother won't let me go. Um, it's the same thing. The government's making me do it, or the minister's making me do it, or the board's making me do it. It actually helps get over that conversation. Well, why is this important? And, you know, I think we need to leverage all of these opportunities to actually galvanize and mobilize everyone to actually do the right thing and, you know, start, as Ian said, to, to move this agenda along on a much, much deeper curve. And so, you know, whether you, you've got local leaders, staff in your own organizations, that we, we need to have them very clear, this, this is critical. Here's what happens if we don't do that. And here's our accountability. And then we need to actually report it. But I think the most important thing is climate change is everyone's file. Everyone has to work on this. And I want to just go to our private sector colleagues, because I think that, you know, and we're, we're seeing this with, you know, the, the oil industry and the, and the gas industry who, you know, are making legitimate attempts to start to decarbonize and make things better. But everybody has to be involved. And, you know, if you're an engineer working for a private sector firm or, or you're, a, you know, a, a climate specialist or a you know, somebody with technical experience and, and you're working with the sectors, you really need to, and I think Ian's right, like we all have to commit to this and we can't wait for government to lay it all out and tell us how to do it. And I think in healthcare, my experience is that we have a little bit of what I would call learned helplessness, that we kind of went, well, the ministry is not making me do it. And they, they seem fine if we don't do that and they, they want to save money. And I think we, we need to step way beyond that and actually, you know, really take things into our own hands and just say, we have to do this. We have to do this for our public. We have to do this for our families. 
And we have to figure out how we, and, and my experience is when you do that and you start to create plans and you share them with government, actually a lot of the time they'll actually take that plan because having worked in government, it's very, very difficult. You don't necessarily always have the expertise to know well, what, what should we be doing and how, how can we do it fast? It's, it's a very tough gig, you know, having the responsibility that government has but not necessarily always the expertise. And I just really, really encourage you and very much su support Ian's um, approach that all of us have to just take the matters into our own hands, do what is best, figure out how to do that in a cost-effective way, figure out how to leverage the opportunities to when we can do that and, and get the job done and, and actually lead, lead our governments um, in, across this country to actually be seeing that we, we don't need them to tell us how to blow our nose and what to do. We, we can get out ahead and do the right thing and tell them why we're doing it. And that will bring them along and, and they'll actually get smarter along that. And then we, we have to learn how to tell the story. And I think we have enough going on in the news to actually do that. Um, but you know, trying to connect it to deeper levels of healthcare where people start to understand their actions as a member of a healthcare organization and you know how with changing that they can actually make the bigger picture better and and connecting people with a story to their role wherever it is in your organization whether they're a cleaner or a neurosurgeon or a ceo it's really important for them to understand like i can make a difference and when i worked in the ministry we we did this um, across the ministries and and many of them were came to health and helping us um, they didn't know what to do. But if you explain to people, well, yeah, actually, you could do this and that, and it actually will make a difference, uh, often they'll do it. So I really encourage you, get your story, identify the opportunities, measure your progress along the way, and, and steepen the curve as much as you can. And, you know, really focus. Focus your efforts on things that are actually going to move the dial. And I always talk about a triple word score or a quadruple word score. If you can if you can get an activity that's going to advance a number of different agendas in the climate change area, that is going to make a difference. So we, we have focus areas that we've landed on in um, our work at Vancouver Coastal. And, you know, everyone will have their own focus areas. There's no magic to these. But what we try to do is, because they are all interrelated, is to find initiatives that will cut across those. And that's where you get your triple word score. So really, really important. And I think as you look at different areas of focus and you can help people understand that it actually, you know, if you're a nurse, you may not see day to day when you're looking after patients on the medicine ward or post-op patients, you may not quite realize how you can contribute. But if, if you take the metro to work and we can explain that, that that's, that's a better way than driving your car, all of these things help and they help across the board. So we've spent quite a lot of time and you can actually see that you know, leadership and innovation is, is a fundamental piece and embedded in that is communication about how important this is. ORs are a major emitter and there's a lot of good work being done in Ontario. You have a, an anesthetist, uh, Dr. Anita Rao, who's done lots of great work. We, we've got a surgeon who works with her, who's our chief climate officer, Dr. Andrew McNeil. Um, that's the first time we've ever had a physician lead a portfolio like this. And she's, she and her colleagues across the country are working um, with Cascade Canada, which is a sort of an enabling collaborative to bring people together to you know, define different targets and to work beyond just the facility um, issue of climate change. And, you know, there's, there's an extensive amount of work that we could do in the ORs, which are one of our biggest clinical areas that, that emit. And what we know is, yeah. So this is the comparison. This is published a few years ago in The Lancet, but it was comparing two different hospitals, one in the UK and uh, our own BGH at, um, in Vancouver General. And just looking in the, just in the operating room exclusively, well, what are the drivers of carbon emission? In the, in the operating room, what you can see it's different, um, different practices and different institutions. And I think to Ian's point, you have, you have to actually look at the data and figure out, you know, what, what are you doing and how are you going to change it? And, you know, we had, because we're, we have a massive amount of hydroelectricity in British Columbia, you know, our, our fuel related, our heat related energy is less. 
And so that in, in our ORs, that was less of an issue for us, but anesthetic gases was a, was a major issue. And there's, a, there's an, an anesthetic, an anesthesia agent called desfurane, desfurane that is a very, very high emitter. And we've just taken it right out of play since this study. Um, I think you know that nitrous oxide is a gas that we don't really use much, and yet we pipe it into all our hospitals. It's part of sort of standards that exist, and we don't need to do that. And half, I think 90% of it leaks out um, through these, the piping and in the, in the actual area of care where it's being used. So, you know, we've, we've actually changed that too, and we're no longer going to pipe uh, nitrous oxide into our hospitals, we're going to just use isolated tanks in areas of care where it's still used. So these are things that we're learning. And these are your clinical colleagues that actually know a lot of this stuff. And that's why I say, you know, because the facilities people are primarily held responsible for our carbon footprint, the more you can integrate horizontally with other leadership in your organization and talk about these things can make a really big difference. And then supply chain, I've talked about before. Um, it's a major area that we're working on. We have a provincial procurement agency, and we're really trying to pick big pieces that have a lot of meat on them, that if you change it, it will make a big difference. And, you know, that's how you start getting things going. And the other thing I, I just want to acknowledge for all of you in facilities, um, you know, getting the money for, you know, uh, a new wave chiller, uh, re recirculating chiller and, you know, heat pumps, and all of that um, is tough. We, we have a terrible problem with funding for that kind of capital investment in British Columbia. And, you know, again, you in some ways you have to kind of take it into your own hand. And the story has to be compelling when you tell your colleagues who want their new CT scans and their MRIs and interventional radiology suites and ultrasounds and all that fancy equipment. They, they need to understand that that's all, at the end of the day, you, you have to invest in some of these other things. And I think those dialogues at the senior level are really important. And we need to be able to communicate, you know, what a difference this is going to make and, and what's the impact. And as the, you know, the visible impacts of climate change increase, um, I think there'll be more responsiveness. But it's not an easy conversation to have. And, you know, down at the bottom is a picture. We, we actually gave away an electric bike in a, in a climate lottery that we had at Lionsgate Hospital, these things send a signal. This is our CFO in the middle there with the, the chief operating officer for the North Shore for the coastal region of care. And, you know, to have our leadership on our senior team saying this is really important and actually doing something like giving away an e-bike seems small, but it actually makes a big difference to engage people. So metrics and accountability, you're very familiar with this. We, we report and you know trends are the only way to do this. Um, sometimes government just wants to know your number, right? But if you don't track the trend, it's, it's a hopeless exercise. And I think the other challenge we have is that our health sector is growing. Our population is growing. Our, our you know, people working for us, we've gone from about 12,500 in 2017 and we're now at 20,000 um, staff. And, than another, you know, five, 8,000 physicians. So, you know, we, we have a big staff across our organization. We have 192 buildings that we own. So those are hospitals, long-term care facilities, assisted living facilities, primary care facilities, um, you know, uh, mental health facilities. And then on top of that, we, we have a whole lot of lease space that is growing because we can't keep up with our capital needs. And we don't have as much control over that, but as you lease a space, you can take that opportunity to create expectations of your landlord. So I'm gonna wrap up and just say, you know, this is such an important area. Um, we are plagued with old infrastructure in this country. I think it's great to see some of these incredible new facilities that are coming on stream uh, in Ontario. But, you know, we need to, while we're waiting for the ability to build and, and properly commission a new facility, we need to clarify our existing opportunities wherever we are and whatever institution we're running. We need a plan. We need to prioritize. So when the opportunity comes along, whether it's from a federal program or um, a provincial program or a philanthropy opportunity, you need to know what your priorities are. So you need to be ready to jump and be nimble. Um, sometimes we have to pivot to take advantage of these things and we need to be able to actually do that. Um, we, we had an opportunity to put 
some improvements in air conditioning in our long-term care facilities from the provincial government. And you know, we we really leapt to that, but made sure that we were doing it in a way that was aligned with you know not polluting more um, with carbon emissions. So that was you had a year to do that, and you had to work fast to actually get those things done. So you know, educate and support your own staff and all your groups, and inspire everyone through that education, that communication, bring it alive for them, and then track your progress. So I think we have, you know. We have lots of opportunity. Time is running out, and I just really encourage all of you in your journey. And you know, we have to work together. We have to partner. We have to get to know each other, know the the kinds of expertise and capacity we have in our own organizations, in external organizations, and you know, try and make it good for um, our kids and our grandkids over the future of this country. So thanks so much, Ian. Dr. Baum, as we mentioned, the session after the break today, we're going to be looking at managing change, where we're hoping people are going to be quite candid about what's broken, what's not working, what can be improved. And then we have the final session of the day, which is going to be talking about taking action, what hospitals need. Those we don't plan to uh, post the recordings from because we want people to be candid. We do want to turn that, and we will turn that into a bit of a white paper for governments. I'm really interested in your experience with government. How do we, uh, you, you'll, you'll notice conspicuous by their absence today is the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not that they're not aware of this, they've got their, whatever their reasons are. Uh, how do we approach government? How do we take that messaging? This is what hospitals need. This is what <laughs> hospitals are willing to contribute mm -hmm. to the climate agenda. How do we get that message to them? Well, I think it, it's, you know, I would say it's not easy always, um, particularly, you know, really since the pandemic, we, we've had increasing polarization of government, you know, across the developed world. Um, but, you know, I think the most important thing is, first of all, you, you need to get a plan that you can take to government and say, this is our plan. And he, here's why it's our plan here, how we've chosen our priorities. And, you know, here are the things that are associated with this plan. And here's, you know, what we need from you. So not just go with what you need. You, you have to go with, you know, this is our institution. Here's our data. Here's how we, we see the, the best opportunities to leverage a really significant improvement in that data that will help you get to your goals. And, you know, we're able to do this, this, and this on our own. We don't need you for that. But there are some things that we, we need you part of. So... So the government understands your whole story. It's an end-to-end -end story of, of what you actually need. And, you know, I, I think we, you need to do work. All of you, I'm pretty sure, have foundations, hospital foundations that raise lots of money. I think we've got to start, you know, we're working with our philanthropists because it's not their favorite thing. They usually like to build a tower or open an OR and have their name on it. But I think if you can even combine that activity with this is, you know, a really sustainable operating room or a sustainable primary care, like we need to engage everyone. And if you can go to government and say, we've engaged our foundation and they're going to raise this amount of money to these initiatives, um, that will be unheard of for them to have, you know, a foundation raising money for a new boiler, right? Or, a, or a, you know, a climate responsive chiller. They, they don't, they've never heard of that in either of the foundations. But I think the thing is, we have to mobilize everyone to actually get there. And we have to bring along our local governments too, because, you know, the more we can partner and actually, it's not about, you know, making a government look bad. No government appreciates that. And that's the fastest way to get your file closed. You have to go very proactively and, you know, pretend you, you don't notice if they look a little bit uncomfortable. But when we know if there's leadership at the elected official level that is not aligned with what needs to be done, then you, you've got to use your best, you know, high ground story, purposeful plan, how it's going to affect their public, because it is their public, and, you know, how you're actually trying to do as much as you can without having to tap um, their coffers. And, you know, to me, that that's the best thing you can do. And then, you know, you, you have to find people whether it's in their own government or in, in other levels of government that, that they, they can see, they align with and, and bring them along too. Because government responds to the public. They were, you know, it is, 
it's a difficult beast to work with government. I've worked there for nearly close to 20 years. And, you know, but but they listen. They listen to their public. They listen to other leaders who, who they align with. And that, those are the kinds of things that actually move them along. They, they look at other provinces. They don't want to be left behind. So they, they'll look around the country and say, well, you know, who's doing what? And you can put that in your in your, um, you know, in your file as well, because it's really all about helping them understand whether they really want to or not. They, they've got to move, move along and help facilitate some of this change because their public fundamentally, which is who they get their job from, is going to really suffer. So that, that, that's what I would say. That, terrific, and it's relationships, right? That's a terrific response. Are there, are there other? Yes, Michael. Hi, thanks. Uh, I'm Katie. I've been a sustainability practitioner in greening healthcare for over 20 years here in Canada and the US. And um, I'm no Dr. Andrea McNeil and think her role as director, medical director of planetary health is inspirational, mm -hmm. but we only have one in this whole country That's right. and she's in Vancouver Coastal Health. And uh, many of the folks in this room work, as you said, in facilities and engineering and infrastructure. And there is a massive divide between yes. what happens on that side of the structural side of, of healthcare and the clinical side of healthcare. We have one example in this entire country of where that bridge is being made. Right. Do you have any suggestions for folks like us who mm -hmm. are doing the infrastructure piece and the what I like to call the scaffolding, the piece that the rest mm -hmm. of the healthcare can hang on to, uh, so that we can actually create these kinds of positions. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be medical director, that's like that's pretty right. highfalutin, yeah. but like even sustainability roles for people where they can connect what's happening. Mm -hmm. Because right now we don't have those roles mm -hmm. that exist in healthcare. Yeah. So it's a really it's a great question. And you know, a couple of things that I would say sort of in the moment. So Cascades Canada, you may be familiar with that's run out of the Dalla Lana School by Fiona, Dr. Fiona Miller, um, an extraordinarily energetic, you know, senior academic. Um, it, it's an enabler. It's a collaborative that's working across the country on the non-facility things largely. And they're bringing together clinicians to train them around from all over the country. They have a couple of, they have a summer training program and they have webinars in, in different areas that they're moving along. Um, that's a really good touch point to, to talk to Fiona and, and her sort of senior steering committee, which is mostly physicians from across the country who are working in this. So that, that's the first thing, to talk to them and actually maybe um, think about sending some representatives to their, to their workshops, because there you're going to learn about the non-facilities things that actually can really make a difference. And, and in your own organizations, like I think if you, if you have access to your senior team is to, you know, really encourage them to give you opportunities to mix in with your, you know, your clinicians. Because I know those divides. Often you're in a different, a different building, right? You never even see them. You don't even know them. But at the senior team, you know, that, those things, those, those teams bring together the clinical side, the operational side, and the, and the sort of what I would call corporate support side that usually includes facilities management. It's reaching out, getting partners. And, you know, as you go about, you know, if you're doing a renovation to bring a new CT in or, or a 3D MRI or, you know, some of this newfangled equipment, you're going to meet, you're going to meet some of the leadership. And I think just starting that conversation and suggesting to your institution that, you know, maybe they could hold a workshop with the board and the senior team to talk about the different aspects and you know have some of the leadership like Andrea McNeil that are spread across the country. It's not just her, you have Anita Rao here who's an anesthetist to come and talk to the board about things that they could do and, and you'll have your senior team exposed to that. And I, I just think it's really, how do you make those connections and then work them and develop them? And you know, we, we've really changed as an organization um, you know, our CEO really started to see, wow, this is really important. And we were lucky. We had Andrea, who's a general surgeon. She has a specialty uh, surgery and oncologic surgery. Um, but she's just a brainiac and, and wanted to do it. And so we took that opportunity and, you know, gave her a title, gave her some prominence in the organization. It's made a massive difference in terms of steepening the curve of people's interests in this. Because I think all of you know you know, like the board chair, you're kind of irrelevant to a lot of the people that work 
um, unless they need you, right? Unless they've, you know, got a flood or anything, and then you're there and they need you, but you're not first on their list, right? To uh, So that's what you need to do. You got to make friends and find people, however it is through your day-to-day -day work that actually you can start to talk about these things with. It's really important. And then with your communications group that all of you have is figure out, okay, well, maybe we can have a climate day where it's an open house and people talk about, you know, what they're doing. Just little things like that start to build that mobilization of all your staff. Hope that helps. Other questions for, for Dr. Ballon? So one of the things I was going to ask you is when yeah. I was in the city and we built the, have you got a question? Yeah, Kyle. Oh, has, sorry, sorry. Has, yeah, go ahead. Kyle Robinson from Executive South. Yeah. Um, I guess the top of the, how would you rate us compared to BC and what you're doing out there? How would you sit there and look at Ontario and, and rate us? And be tough, because I think, you know, I would say one of the biggest challenges we have is that we always try to find the, the positive aspects, but you saw from the pictures and even yeah. this past summer, right, I think for the first time, we all really experienced what climate right. change is, right? We, we read about it, so, you know, we talk about it, but all of a sudden everybody had a hard time breathing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but so when you come here and you see how far behind we are in Ontario, mm -hmm. how would you rate us? Yeah, I, I don't think we're... I mean, we have an advantage in British Columbia in that, you know, the majority of our energy is hydroelectric, which is a problem with climate change, because as glaciers dry up, which they're doing, I'm not quite sure what we're going to do. And I hope people are thinking about that at BC Hydro. But, you know, we have that, that advantage. Um, I, I think we are very aggressive on sustainable transportation in our province, particularly in the lower mainland, where, you know, two thirds of our public live. Um, and I know that, you know, from coming back and forth and, you know, I think public transit has suffered in, in Ontario for quite a while, especially in the greater Toronto area. Um, in terms of our health infrastructure, we're probably worse than you because we, we had, you know, many, many years where there just was just insufficient capital investment in new facilities. And the, this government now has realized that and is investing a massive amount of money and it's costing them way more per square foot or per bed or whatever you want to call it because of COVID and the supply chain issues and you know the human resource issues and that's really too bad because I think it's discouraging them but they're you know they're carrying on but we're our infrastructure is probably some of the oldest um, other than the maritimes probably uh, in the country so we we have a lot of work to do um, but I think we may be farther ahead in terms of our government totally recognizes it. So they, they are leaders and have been for, you know, 20 years. And um, I think our public, because we've been more exposed to the direct impact with floods um, and uh, forest fires and all of these evacuations that are happening now, it's, it's really quite a few years now in the summers um, in the interior and in the north where we're evacuating people routinely. I think that has spurred on local governments and the province to, to wake up. So I think in awareness, mobilization, we're farther ahead. In terms of actual results, I'm not sure. You can, you can see our data from DCH. It's, you know, it's, it's flat or coming down a little bit. We're a long way off from our goals at 2030. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. Yeah. Dr. Ballon, once again, you set the stage for the day beautifully and uh, thanks for these comments. And I hope you can stay for some of the rest of the day. I know you have to fly out this afternoon, but uh, if you can stick around for some of the, the conversations, love to have your, your insights on what we're going to be talking about going forward. So thank you so much again. Yeah, thanks so much, Eve.